Welcome everybody. My name is Diana Mackay and I'm going to welcome you to the webinar today and just offer a few brief housekeeping announcements before we get started. It is uh, a real delight that so many of you have joined us from all around the world uh, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, some of you very early in your day, some of you very late in your day. Thank you for your time. Uh, we're going to make full use of the Zoom webinar capacities, so I want to encourage you during the course of the webinar today to uh, insert questions in the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen there. You'll be able to tap on that and ask some questions as we proceed. And I'd also encourage you to use the chat function if you'd like to uh, make use of that and direct your comments to anyone in particular. Um, most of you, I hope, have received the document that I circulated earlier today with the bios of our speakers and panelists. So I'm going to help us save time by not having extensive introductions, but rather very brief introductions. And in that spirit, I will get underway with introducing Dr. Zulfi Bhutta, who is the Distinguished University Professor and Founding Director of the Institute for Global Health and Development and the Center of Excellence in Women and Child Health at Aga Khan University. He also holds the Robert Harding Inaugural Chair in Global Child Health at the, at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada, and is co-director of the Sick Kids Center for Global Child Health. Uh, in keeping with my promise, I'll stop there, but his full bio really does underscore Dr. Butas. Uh, he is someone who has already made an enormous positive impact in the lives of so many people around the world, especially women and children, and we can uh, anticipate there's still so much more to come. Over to you, Dr. Butas. Thank you very much, Anna, and thank you very much for joining, ladies and gentlemen. This is indeed a unique uh, event in the history of the Institute for Global Health and Development, which has just got going. So this is our inaugural webinar, taking full advantage of the circumstances that surround us, which have also created enormous opportunities for linking people remotely and at a level of efficiency that we did not have before. It is perhaps important to underscore that the Institute for Global Health and Development, an investment of the Aga Khan University, which spans all its campuses, uh, faculties, institutes, and is very closely linked to the Aga Khan Development Network, is very deliberate initiation of a platform uh, that allows interdisciplinary work and particularly bringing in the whole dimension of understanding many drivers health and development that go way be beyond health. And today's topic is a reflection of the kind of thing that we are encouraging for many faculty members, students uh, uh, across Aga Khan University and Aga Khan Development Network to come together to address. So the issue of climate change and health is no stranger to anybody who is working in the discipline of global development. It is for many an existential threat to, to humanity, to mankind, and in the eyes of others is responsible for many of the crises that are in front of us, whether or not the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has had its roots and its genesis in the whole issue of environmental uh, degradation as a consequence of climate change is, is a moot question that maybe some of our speakers might address. But certainly what's happening on the Pacific coast of the United States is a tragedy of enormous proportion. And, and is also a reflection of the enormous challenges that are confronting both people in high income countries and those in low and middle income countries. Karachi has seen intense weather recently with uh, unprecedented floods uh, in virtually one, one in a century uh, uh, situation and has also had extreme weather events in recent years with unprecedented heat waves. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, our very honorable chair of the International Advisory Committee of the Institute for Global Health and Development, uh, Dr. Michael Merson, who's no stranger to people working in global health, is currently the Wolfgang Jochtek Professor of Global Health at Duke University and the founding director of the Singapore Health at Duke National University of Sciences Global Health Institute. He's had a long and illustrious career and to many people in the field, particularly pediatricians, is the person who used to be responsible for diarrheal disease and ARI services at the World Health Organization, followed by a long and illustrious career, um, and both at WHO and Yale in, um, in initiating a global AIDS pandemic response. So Mike, over to you. 
to provide us your welcome remarks. Thank you, uh, Zofi. Welcome, everyone. It's been a privilege to uh, chair the advisory committee. We have a very uh, distinguished group of members, including uh, Haile DeBas, uh, who is the um, chair of the AKU Board of Trustees. Uh, and um, I think the main message I want to give all of you is that we have met twice and we have been very uh, impressed and um, pleased with the, uh, this new institute. Uh, the goals, the mission that uh, Zofi and his team have set out are highly appropriate in today's world. The idea that it is an institute not only of global health but also development is very important and as I would again say very timely uh, as the COVID pandemic has shown us. The focus of the new institute on interdisciplinary work uh, which is central to global health and development research and education. The fact that the Institute is making use of the Aga Khan network of institutions, focusing in parts of the world, in particular Pakistan and Central Asia, and even to some extent parts of East Africa, that have really have not gotten enough attention in, in, um, in global health. Um, many of these are Muslim majority countries, and that's very important for understanding uh, the, uh, the disease patterns and the social and cultural uh, and economic determinants of disease, which are going to be a focus of this institute. We um, on the committee have been strongly encouraging uh, Zofi to have a, a priority set of research uh, topics and um, also to have a very important educational component uh, to bring along the future leaders in global health. And we're delighted that, that Zofi has taken this on. The, one of the priority areas that obviously has been chosen uh, by the Institute is climate change. Uh, and uh, I can't think of a, a, great, a topic of greater importance. Zofi, you've all already mentioned the fire, the wildfire, the forest fires, the wildfires that we're seeing now in almost eight to 10 states in, in, in this country. Uh, moving into Canada, I learned this morning, uh, even um, in Vancouver, you're seeing some of, the, um, uh, some of the smoke and already affecting the environment there. So I, I'm, I, I want to say lastly that um, uh, this is just the beginning as uh, as Zofi has said, of what we think is a very exciting and very important initiative. Um, and and uh, personally, I'm delighted to see so many uh, of you uh, attending this first seminar, uh, webinar, and that we have so many um, really good speakers to talk about this topic. Uh, so I wish you the best, Zofi, on behalf of the committee, and turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Mike, and thank you for your care and guidance. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be very efficient and now try and briefly introduce our three main speakers, and I'll follow their presentations uh, by an introduction of the panelists. Uh, so, I would request the individual speakers to then hand over uh, to the next speakers in order. We'll start with Professor Majida Zati, uh, who will then hand over to Professor Zafar Fatmi, and in turn to Professor Evans Katui. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, the three plenary speakers. Uh, Professor Majid Azadi, to many people in international development, is, in his own words, as he says for others, a rock star in environmental health. He's a professor of global environmental health at Imperial College in London. Uh, he and his research group have conducted some of the seminal studies on uh, air pollution. Uh, in Africa uh, and also in China. And he was the leader of the WHO's comparative risk assessment project uh, in the early 2000s, which led to a landmark report on reducing risks and promoting healthy lives. Um, Majid lives, uh, uh, leads the NCD risk collaboration, and today he will speak to us on a neglected topic that very few speak on, which is the relationship of injuries with climate change. 
Following Professor Azadi, we'll have uh, our own Professor Dr. Fatmi from the Department of Community Health Sciences at the Aga Khan University in Karachi. And, and Zafar is a very highly qualified uh, scientist in environmental health uh, with qualifications from um, uh, various global institutions. And importantly, he has led several of the landmark studies in Pakistan on looking at the whole range of environmental pollution, lead, as well as uh, the whole issue of water sanitation hygiene. He serves as the, he has served as the director of the community residency program uh, for almost 10 years. Uh, Professor uh, Evans Katui is the director of the East Africa Institute at Arkhan University. And he's also uh, eminently qualified with almost two decades of experience in program development in Africa and South Asia. He actually has a PhD in atmospheric chemistry from University of Nairobi Max Planck Institute for Chemistry, Germany, and has also served uh, with Canada's IDRC as a senior program specialist for agriculture and the environment. So as you can see, all of our three main speakers are eminently qualified to speak on the topic. And without further ado, let me call upon Professor Azati to speak on injuries, the forgotten risk for global climate change. Thank you, Zulfi. Uh, can I just ask if you can see my screen uh, with the slide on it? You can. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks for the invitation uh, and 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 uh, congratulations to the institute. I, I must say that that actually Aga Khan University is particularly close to my heart, uh, both in the Karachi side and and East Africa. Um, I actually uh, thirty odd years ago uh, lived in Karachi as a refugee, and and Aga Khan was actually the place that I would go to to be able to get. Uh, very good healthcare and 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 its beautiful campus with the red buildings was sort of you know the 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 the, the vision of great university that I had and and then uh, you know East Africa obviously is where my research career began so 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 both of its both of its sites are are close to my heart um I'll talk about injuries in the context of 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 global climate change and 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 um. A part of my talk, the middle part of it, will have actually a slightly American flavor to it, uh, partly because data are so good. Uh, but, but I'll come back to actually say that uh, some of the things we learned from, from America, uh, what it actually might mean for, for, for elsewhere in the world. So, so let me start with, um, with this graph. This is from the Lancet Countdown on, the health in, uh, on, uh, on climate change. So, so, so each year, the Countdown, which is a very well-known program, puts out a report. Uh, uh, the, this year's report was, was relatively recent and talks about um, uh, what's happening to climate change and, and in relation with, with the human health angle. And, and um, uh, so, so, so when I went back and looked at this, actually it turns out that injuries aren't explicitly mentioned to it um which i must say i was expecting at least in this schematic diag diagram to be there so so we know a fair amount about uh, you know heat heat does a whole lot to human physiology and, and so does cold and and they change uh, vector and habitats uh, and and people have written a, a fair amount about what happens in the con what could happen in the context of global climate change in relation to vector borne diseases dengue malaria and, and so on and 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 the issue of food security that i see is one of the chats has come up it changes agriculture but what happens to injuries has not been a subject of uh, of systematic work and and uh, when i come uh, I'll come back to this, so that actually there is a whole other body of work in public health that has looked at injuries in relation to seasons, and, and yet the two haven't come together. So, so, so um, I think for many people this would be familiar, but I thought I would just be very explicit. In, in, uh, in uh, WHO classification or in something like the global burden of disease, diseases are uh, somewhat artificially, but, but for actually very good reasons, divided into communicable maternal, perinatal, nutritional, non-communicable, there is obviously links between them, um, and then injuries, which can be intentional and unintentional. And, and, and broadly, the intentional category becomes um, uh, uh, a suicide as well as acts of violence, whether it's uh, individual violence, homicide, or, or collective violence, acts of war, and then road traffic injuries. And then for unintentional, there is falls and drownings and a whole bunch of things like that. Um, 
Now, what this graph is showing is showing uh, deaths by by year by 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 age group um, uh, in the world, uh, and uh, and the blue sections are injuries. It's divided into suicide. Suicide has a particular uh, significance for for some of the regions you're interested in. I'll come back to it again later. And and as we can see, uh, we can see from my mouse. Um, so, so in, in younger stages, a fair amount of, of, of communicable disease, that's infections and, and nutritional. In older ages, non-communicable diseases become relevant. Actually, in young adults, so, so in people in, in their 20s and 30s, uh, and especially in males, uh, the blue sections are actually the largest section. So, so, so young adults die more than anything else of injuries. And obviously, these are years that are that are uh, productive years, a fair amount of, uh, a large number of, of years of life lost. Um, uh, this is uh, from WHO Global Health Statistics, and, and, and again, divided into similar categories, uh, communicable and, and nutritional maternal in orange, uh, chronic uh, non-communicable in blue, and injuries in purple. And you know, I've been looking at these numbers for about you know, 20 years now, and Every time I see this, I actually am, am amazed uh, that uh, that road traffic injuries are one of the ten leading causes of death in the world, and um, and actually going up uh, in, uh, in over time. And and again, these are things that are killing largely young adults. Self harm is one of the top twenty. It's it's more than a stomach cancer. It's it's the same number as as colon cancer for for suicides. Road traffic injuries is larger than many of the both uh, communicable and non-communicable diseases that are actually attracting massive investments. Uh, so, 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 so major cause of that and, and, and affecting, again, people at the prime of their lives. Um, just to sort of give one other number, there is, there is a lot of heterogeneity. So this is from the work of, of Global Burden of Diseases Study, 21 regions of the world. And, and, and on the left-hand side, females. On the right-hand side, males. Divided in inju injury types. I don't want to get into the details of this, but, but we can see that something like self-harm, that is massive in the same age group, 15 to 49-year-olds, massive variation across regions. So, so much more in Eastern Europe in this case than, than let's say, in, in parts of Latin America. Whereas, uh, whereas uh, violence is much more in some regions than, than elsewhere. So, 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 so a lot of variability across regions. And again, I'll come to the significance of context uh, as we finish. So, going for a little while to the to the uh, to the American context, and um, and I should say this work was uh, was uh, we were actually pleased that that the group that paid the most attention to this was the medical community rather than the climate change community. I think the sort of the medical and public health community have always cared about injuries because they see this in the hospitals, in the trauma units. And, and the fact that it was linked to climate change, some of the really good work on, on road traffic injuries has come actually from some of Mike's former colleagues at Yale that have looked at temperature and, 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 and climate change and, and people who have looked at, again, other aspects of injuries. Um, so in the context of the US, um, this is by age group, and again, as we can see, especially in males, and uh, but but generally in, in young adults, injuries are a significant uh, you know uh, cause of that. This is about four decades of of, of data put together. And that's uh, you know a lot of effect from transportation, a lot of effect from assault. So this is homicides and from self harm. As people get to older ages, it's actually a lot of times it falls that 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 uh, that are a cause of uh, of of that. Um, now this is the part that again the clinical and public health community has been very familiar with, but the climate change community has not as much paid attention to, which is that historically injuries are really seasonal and um, and uh, it may not be a surprise that in the North American context in the summer months more people die of drowning uh, that that may not be much of a surprise but look at road traffic injuries look at suicides um, even they are very seasonal and and in in US uh, uh, especially but also in Europe people have been writing in, uh, about this for decades in a public health context that that um, and, and, and look at falls, they actually dip in the summer and they are more in winter, is that, that a whole set of injuries have highly seasonal patterns. And, and what this led us to do is that, well, does temperature matter or is it something else about the seasons that matters? And, 
and um, and this was where the American data became quite useful. We had we had 40 years of data uh, with a lot of geographical information. So we knew whether it was in the north, south, east, west, and, and, and the state and the county of residence. Uh, that means that we could match it to temperature data. And what we did was that we created a new measure, which we call temperature anomaly. And, and, and I guess, uh, you know, just to give an anecdotal uh, example of why this is relevant. When I was working in Kenya, I was working in Lakipia district uh, at the base of Mount Kenya. So, so um, I would be getting up in the morning and saying, gosh, what a warm day. I'm going to go out. To, we're going to the field at five or six in the morning. Our Kenyan colleagues were actually wrapping themselves in, co in quotes because it was a cold day relative to what they were used to. So, so, so in some sense, as humans, uh, uh, you know, to some extent through physiology, but to a large extent through technology, housing um, and, and uh, how we design our homes, how we live our lives, we adapt to our local temperature. So, so taking an American example, this is showing in the month of July, temperature in Florida, and this is in the same month in, in, uh, in, in Minnesota. Now, Florida is always warmer than Minnesota in July, but Florida is much more stable. So, so for Florida and context, so this is what we introduced actually as one of what we consider to be innovations, which is that we actually talked about anomaly rather than average temperature. So, so again, to bring it for those who are familiar with, uh, with, uh, with the American context, um, you know, it gets hot in Chicago for a week and people die. It's always as hot in Arizona and people seem to have ad adapted to that. And, and so we created this measure of anomaly, which is that compared to long-term situation that people are used to, and, and, and if it's farmers, they get used to it in a particular way through certain crops that they plant or through certain ways of, of, uh, of getting water for their crops. Uh, if it's homes, people become used to it in a particular way. But these anomalies are what we cannot handle. And actually, Minnesota has much larger anom anomalies. Florida is generally within one or two degrees in the month of July, whereas Minnesota is within many degrees. And, and actually, as we go through this, for every US state and for every month of the year, we can see that generally there is larger anomaly where it's darker in winter months than in summer months. And generally northern states, South Dakota and Minnesota, have more anomaly than some of the southern states. If you went to Hawaii, which we didn't include in this because it's far away from the rest of America, there is almost no variation. So, so back to the health aspects of this. So what this graph is showing is at each age group, the relationship, the epidemiological relationship, accounting for a whole bunch of other factors that, that I won't get into between temperature anomaly, warmer years, and, and, and the risk of injury. Um, so again, not surprisingly, when it's warmer, there is a 15% increase for two degrees warmer uh, of, of dying from drowning, more so in males than, than in females. And, and actually, we learned that one of the reasons that it's larger in males is that American males die more in open waters than, than females. So people go to the river or to the lake or, or to the ocean and, and, and swim. Um, but there is also increasing risk of road traffic injuries and assault, um, especially in younger ages, and of suicides of all of the ages. For falls in the older ages, the warmer it is, the lower the, the risk, uh, whereas for younger ages, actually, the, the warmer it is, the, the higher the risk. So, so numbers on this side means higher risk, on this side, lower risk. <laughs> so if we take all of this and actually put numbers on it, we see that in a year that's anomalously warm, and obviously, you can play with, with this, make it a particular month, but we took the whole year just for illustration. Um, there is some lowering of deaths in the older ages. So this is the older ages, and that's generally as a result of less falls. Um, but there is increased risk in younger, uh, in younger and middle ages of a whole range of other injuries. And this is divided by month. Uh, so, so falls coming down and, and, and road traffic and, and drownings and, and assaults and suicides going up. Um, so um, as we were Getting this result, one of the things that, that we were wondering was why. Um, 
And as a drowning, it's in intuitive, warmer summer, people go and swim more, and, and, uh, but, but we actually realize there is a particular role for open waters. Uh, transport injuries, um, it could actually change alcohol consumption where alcohol is consumed, but it, it seems actually that there is a literature that there is a, there is a effect on driving performance with, with extra warm weather. And actually it turns out that generally, at least in the American context, people drive more when it's warmer. Um, falls, slipping on ice, uh, especially for older ages. Suicides, and, and again, there seems to be some physiological effect. And, and there were actually writings from uh, the old uh, British travelers of, of what happens when they go to a warm climate that they are not used to. There seems to be a physiological effect, but um, of, of, of warm, but, uh, you know, there may be other mechanisms, and again, I'll come to that. And, and violence, again, there may be effects through aggression, uh, but, but actually more encounters. Warmer weather, people are out more, they run into each other more, and potentially alcohol. Um, so let me bring this back to South Asia now. So this was a really nice study done, uh, done um, in, in India <coughs> that looked at... Um, <coughs> looked at Indian farmers and looked at suicide. So, so what this study found was that um, if you look at temperature during growing season versus non-growing season, in the growing season, if temperature got too warm um, and rainfall got too low, um, then suicide would go up. Uh, whereas if it was non-growing season, it didn't seem to have an effect. So, so more rainfall is good, less rainfall is bad. Warmer temperature in growing season is bad, but in non-growing season, it doesn't seem to matter. So, so whereas in the American context, the, the, the roots here may be, uh, may be uh, through aggression or through, uh, through driving more or, or through alcohol consumption, in the Indian context, uh, so in the South Asian context, I couldn't find a Pakistani or a Bangladeshi study. In the, in the Indian context, it seems to be through growing. And, and of course, again, bringing it to our colleagues in East Africa, some of what has been happening uh, in, uh, in, uh, in tensions uh, around, uh, around grasslands and, 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 uh, and the lowlands uh, where there has been cattle and large ranches and, and as, as there is enough rain and as the cattle can graze, uh, the amount of actually confrontation is less as droughts come or floods come uh, by the virtue of uh, restrictions on resources. So, so, so to bring it back again to, to the climate change issue, um, I think uh, what this analysis and, and a number of others have looked at, it really has, um, has two implications. One is that we tend to think of climate change through its effects on, on, on vector borne, uh, which generally affects really young ages and, and, and chronic diseases, which is older ages. Um, young adults are generally left out of the health risk assessment. And, and, um, and um, climate change is one of these effects, but, but I would say that uh, 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 while, while COVID and climate change from the perspective of their health effects are different things, one of the things that the current situation is bringing is that shocks and anomalies, whatever they are, they actually have really large effects on young people. Um, and the second one is that um, while these effects will get over time, large over time, Adaptation measures, situations that can actually protect people from shocks, um, they will actually have immediate benefits. So, so if we have mechanisms of dealing with, with, with droughts, uh, we will have benefits right now. And obviously, as climate change happens, it will allow societies to, to adapt to it. So let me stop now and pass it to my colleagues, and, and I look forward to eventually coming to the questions and discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Majid, uh, and fantastic. And may I request now Zafar, Zafar Fatmi, if you could kindly share your screen and, and uh, talk to us about the impact of household air pollution on health and climate in Pakistan mitigation strategies. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Gupta, and thank you, uh, Dr. Majid. Um, good evening from Pakistan. I'm Zafar Fatmi, and I'm going to speak about the impact of household air pollution on health and solid fuels, fuel use on health and climate in Pakistan, and what are the mitigation strategies. 
So I'm going to discuss this uh, in relation to the global strategies as well. So solid fuel use and household air pollution has been now recognized as a major health risk for the developing countries. And solid fuel use and household air pollution uh, has, has you know, shifted from wood conservation and forest conservation to a health issue for the poor. When this shift was happening, uh, you know, the climate agenda has come put to the forefront and dominated uh, you know, the, the action, most of the action of sustainable development. So how this household air pollution uh, you know, relates with health and also with climate, what are the overlap and what are the distinction between these? So it, it's important to, uh, to know that. So uh, with this, this is this uh, graph is called energy ladder. So most of the uh, you know developed countries and developed communities use uh, for cooking uh, clean fuel, which is called liquid petroleum gas, natural gas, and electricity is on top of the ladder. While uh, the poor communities and developing countries use coal, wood, crop waste, and animal dung at the bottom of the ladder. And about 40% uh, of the global population use, uh, you know, this solid fuel. And uh, about half of the population in Pakistan also use solid fuel, and certainly more in rural areas. This solid fuel uh, is, is inefficient and inconvenient to burn, and also produces a lot of pollution. So this picture, you know, shows that you know, all the burning are similar in the sense that whether you're burning in the mountain lungs or whether you're burning in kitchen uh, for cooking with, with the woods, or you're burning in vehicles or industries or for energy sector, the, the emission which occurs in terms of particles and gases overlap quite a bit, but the concentration which it achieves in the mountain lungs and the cooking environment is much higher than other, you know, ambient air environment. And that's how it relates with uh, health impact when you have higher concentrations so of 8 million diagy2, smoking, and you know, uh, 3.8 3 million diagy2 uh, household air pollution. So, this is just a map showing the share of death due to household air pollution. And um, certainly, more people are, uh, you know, more, the countries in Africa and Asia share most of the deaths. Uh, so about 20% or 15% of their total deaths is, is, is associated with, sorry, with household air pollution. 5% of total deaths are associated with, uh, you know, in Pakistan with household air pollution. And these deaths are related with acute low respiratory tract infection among children, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, ischemic heart disease, stroke and lung cancer among adults. This graph is a summary of uh, the studies about uh, concentration of particulate matter due to solid fuel use in kitchen and living rooms. On the left, you have the list of studies and their you know, particle size they've measured and the size of the study, the end. And along the y-axis, you see the red, green, and blue dotted lines, which are the ambient air quality standards, which means that the level should be below that level in order to protect health. But if you see the living rooms and kitchen concentrations are actually between 500 to 1500 micrograms per meter cube, which is about 10 to 34. We did similar studies in Pakistan comparing natural gas kitchen with biomass user kitchen, and we see the same difference about 70 micrograms in natural gas kitchen versus 531 micrograms per meter cube in, in you know, biomass or solid fuel users. Um, those were averages, but if you see, uh, you know, throughout the day, there are uh, when the stove is burning and, and the preparation for breakfast, lunches, or dinners are being done, the values goes up to from 1,200 to about 2,000, um, and this is the period where, you know, for a few hours, also the women and children are closer to the kitchen and closer to the stove. The blue line below shows the levels of a natural gas kitchen, which is made below. So uh, based on these measurements, this, this is the exposure response curve, which has been developed globally by Bernard. 
And this on the left says chronic obstructive pulmonary disease mortality risk factor and the lung cancer mortality risk associated with ambient air, which is in the you know, green dots down below, and household air pollution, which is the shaded boxes. And on the right, it shows the dotted, uh, you know, the black dot which is for the active smoking. So household air pollution exposure and the risk actually lies between active smoking and passive smoking and ambient air. And it is between two to five fold comparatively. So moving on, so we did you know, a few studies about household air pollution and health. So this is the small study where 73 women who had myocardial infarction and unstable angina, they collectively called acute coronary syndrome. And they were compared with you know, the similar non-smoking women of the same ages uh, with other conditions other than acute coronary syndrome. And uh, what we found was surprising, you know, the risk for solid fuel user woman was about 4.8 times compared to the natural gas users. So this was a small study and we were wondering whether the results are valid. So we organized a more larger, you know, study on the same where we uh, studied 1,000 women and 364 were acute coronary, coronary syndrome cases and double the number of controls. What we found, the results were cons consistent that we found 4.8 risk, uh, you know, adjusted odds ratio. And importantly, we also found that once the risk, uh, you know, develops, it never goes away because those women who left cooking for long period also had the similar risk if they had used the biomass before in their lifetime. So with this, uh, you know, this is just an illustration of ambient, you know, integrated exposure response curve, which was developed by uh, Bernard et al. in the dotted line over here. It shows, you know, same the developed country ambient air pollution, secondhand smoke, uh, you know, relative risk, and oxygen ambient air zone falls a little above. And they say that household air pollution-related global studies have a risk of about two to two point five. And above that are smokers. But our studies are way here, you know, just you know, four to five times higher. And that's where we have raised question about this, that I have global studies we have reviewed systematically and found that there are very few well-conducted uh, household air pollution studies. So this needs to be revisited. So coming to, with this background, coming to, you know, uh, this uh, mitigation efforts, what needs to be done? So carbon, you know, so we need to understand the emission, different kind of emission, like uh, carbon dioxide is a major uh, global climate change uh, climate driver. And that, and, and on the other hand, particulate matter emission, which is on the, you know, troposphere or the lower atmosphere, it causes about 95% mortality. And there are certain other emissions like black carbon, methane, ground level ozone, or hydrofluorocarbons, etc., are called short-lived climate pollutants. They have they are the drivers of climate change, but they are also the drivers of health. So some pollutants are more driving the health uh, impact, and the others are driving more of uh, you know climate impact. Like carbon dioxide is is harmless otherwise uh, directly although it affects the health uh, indirectly. So based on this, this map was developed that there are climate impact hotspots and there are emission hotspots uh, globally. And the climate impact hotspots like habitat and health get impacted. Um, so if you have green areas where health and habitat both are impacted, but on the left side of the uh, you know, map, there's emission hotspots. So some of the countries are have high ambient air pollution, but also have high household air pollution, and they are called emission hotspots because they are impacted because of those emissions. So this, uh, you know, gives you uh, some guidance as what strategies needs each country needs to adapt, and also, uh, you know, this should be guided by the, the the national inventories as what are the sources of these exposures. So based on, you know, globally, uh, if you look at what are the interventions for household, you know, household air pollution. So one is obviously improved stoves. 
which have been shown, which has shown variable access throughout. Uh, so this one is study we conducted in Pakistan also a follow-up study where we compared traditional three-stone stove with improved stove with chimney. And we found uh, a substantial reduction in particulate matter from about 600 to 78, and also per, you know, carbon monoxide from 10 to two. And there was a reduction in health system symptoms also. Uh, for example, the cough and et cetera were reduced and they were all at, at just at relative risk were protective. But the question was, if the, are these uh, you know, levels which it achieves are protective for health? Certainly not, because uh, it, it requires more efficient stove. And that has been shown globally that uh, it reduces uh, emission. It may be helpful for climate change, but it's not protecting health. So there's a search for more efficient um, stoves and more efficient technology. And we are also searching that. So we are currently you know, testing a hybrid solar stove in Tata, Pakistan. And this is this utilizes some of the solar energy and uh, tries to burn the biomass or solid fuel more efficiently. This has been also been used in Africa to some extent, where it also has a benefit to charge the mobile phones, etc. Liquid petroleum gas or the or is an alternative fuel considered globally, and we have a plan to conduct such studies in future. This is one study I found about the cost benefit of different stoves and LPG or liquid petroleum gas in Haryana, India. And it says, what well, it says that a blower stove and chimney stove, the two stoves were compared with LPG stove across the wealth quartile. And it shows clearly that the death averted or deadlies averted per million is spent are much higher for LPG. So there is a case for LPG, you know, uh, uh, proposition for, for the developing countries. Um, so there are also co benefits of mitigation happen climate. So the, if you are using LPG or cleaner fuels, they say it's life, but it reduces emission also. So it has climate impact. There are traditional, if you replace kerosene traditional stove, uh, it reduces black carbon, but it also reduces the risk of burns and poisoning. So women and children uh, are disproportionately affected by HAP. Uh, so it has health impact, health gains, but also is a gain in health equity. So with all this, I come to conclusions, my slide, that HAP household air pollution climate drivers are overlapping, but they're also distinct and they need to be looked at separately as well. And the integrated exposure response function need more studies, uh, particularly for ISD, we, we have uh, said that. And there are two main strategies, measures for uh, household air pollution. One is, uh, you know, combustion should be made efficient, and also this alternative fuel uh, should be sought. So these strategies needs more uh, studies and more push. The last two bullets are actually the advocacy points. Uh, you know, the clean fuel access should be considered social cause, like provision of vaccine and medicine. So there should be some funding, uh, you know, for clean fuel access to the, to the rural poor or the poor people globally. And also solid fuel uses the world's poorest and contribute very little to greenhouse gas. So there should be a subsidization for clean fuel as was done, you know, uh, for in Haryana, India, it's called Give It Up campaign where uh, rich are actually giving it up, giving up their subsidization for the poor, and there's more uh, LPG available for the poor. So it's an environmental justice issue. With this, uh, I thank you uh, everyone for listening to me, and I hand it over to Evans for the next presentation. Thank you. Go ahead, Evans. Pleasure to have you. And uh, you are going to talk to us about strategies yeah. for effective uh, household air pollution reduction in East Africa. Please. Thank you. I hope you can all hear me now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, as you may uh, imagine, the East African uh, landscape is 
quite vast with quite varied uh, 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 geographies, like you know, with dry lands. We have a big uh, lake basin. We have a, you know, long coastline, and we have highlands. All of which have had different, uh, you know, experiences with climate-related uh, uh, health circumstances. You know, beginning from heat waves and vector-borne diseases like malaria and so on. But increasingly, I think the most important uh, uh, disease that is, uh, or rather, group of diseases that is uh, worrying policymakers are those related uh, with uh, respiratory health. And they have been associated mainly with the use of uh, uh, household uh, fuels. So um, I'm having trouble moving this. Uh, my slides are not moving. Diana, is there any way you can spin from that end? Yeah, I can do so. OK. Just a moment. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, Diana sorts that out. Um, I guess you can you talk have to be unfair and Diana would have to, yeah. Go ahead. All right. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, let's move down. Move to the next, please. Next, please, then. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so um, as I was saying, Increasingly, the most important uh, respiratory-related disease uh, in the country, Kenya, here, has been, you know, has been put as respiratory-related diseases. And these are currently occupying about 25% of the total burden of health in the country, according to the most recent economic survey that uh, the country has um, carried out. And most importantly, it's also touching on the age under five. So kids are really uh, in trouble here. So if you look at the graph that I've shared on the side, it shows that over the last five years, we've had a significant reduction in respiratory related ailments. Uh, and this, again, if you look, is still leading, but there is a close correlation between that reduction and the drop, or, or, or rather, and the increase in LPG uptake. So there has been lots of households taking on uh, liquefied petroleum gas as their main uh, fuel, mainly because of the zero rating that the government uh, put in place uh, about five years ago. So people do not pay tax on that. Let's go to the next, please. So there's a delay here, just yeah. a second. Okay. All right. Yeah, so the next slide will show you um, performance in terms of the two, two of the key fuels. Um, okay. Yeah, it's, I'm so sorry, but it seems like there's a, a problem with uh, my screen advancing as well. Mm hmm I don't know why that is. Let me see if I can do it another way. No. Okay. All right. Can I do it without the full screen option? So you could move it that way at least. Let me see if I can get this to work. Yes. Yeah. So on this particular screen, um, we saw the steady rise in electricity users in the country. This include those who are using uh, solar PV connections. And that sharp increase has been attributed over the last 10 years to increased policy conditions that have encouraged the private sector, particularly those involved in financing uh, of technologies who have churned out very interesting products for uh, common users to be able to access um, uh, technologies, particularly solar PV. So a very high number of uh, you know, people, both in uh, the poor urban areas and the uh, rural. 
are all using uh, electrical. But if you look at the red uh, bars, that shows the kerosene users. And there has been a sharp drop over the last 10 years for two main reasons. One is because of the, um, the encouraging news about uh, the uh, shift to LPG, which was also encouraged by uh, uh, zero rating it. But also because we have many unscrupulous traders in the country who buy kerosene and use it to blend and uh, adulterate diesel so that they sell it to the big uh, transport uh, truckers and so on. And so to discourage that, the government put in a levy uh, or, or rather a duty on the price of kerosene, so raising the price of kerosene, so making it uh, quite, um, you know, uh, not interesting for people to buy it anymore compared to the LPG, which was cleaner and the prices uh, had significantly come down, uh, in addition to it being a status fuel also. Next, please, Diana, if you can. I'm terribly sorry, but my screen's not going to allow me to advance the slide. So let's see if we can fix this one more time. Um, Shamsa, are you able to give it a go from there? I try it again. It seems that I have to stop sharing each time and then share again, which is a bit frustrating. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so the main sources of the, few of, uh, the emissions have been, of course, the traditional uh, charcoal stoves and the kerosene stoves, which uh, you know, are quite old and there's very old technology. But unfortunately, over 65% of the population still employs this on a day today basis. And of course, uh, the bottom line is last year we had a very good uh, record whereby we had at least 54% of the urban users are now using LPG as their primary fuel. And we hope that this number is going to increase. But again, we had uh, uh, some scare recently when the government, after the budget, decided to bring back uh, VAT on uh, LPG, something that really scared the market and uh, after some noise from the public, uh, the parliament decided to hold on to it for another year. So that simply shows you the force that policy change can really have on uptake. Um, now, where's the problem? The interventions that we have today and in the recent past have mainly been crafted and promoted by institutions, these uh, NGOs and uh, uh, quasi-government organizations, or even political agencies that have uh, packaged the messages around uh, energy efficiency, you know, and therefore having cookstoves. Some of them have used the forest resource conservation as the uh, uh, platform upon which uh, to go around this. Several others have also used the climate change uh, platform as an entry point. For example, when we had the NAMAS, the Nationally Appropriate Mitigation Actions. So these uh, have been like the main uh, uh, you know, basis upon which promoting these uh, energy efficient stops have been held. But the challenge is that whereas significant gains have been reported when it comes to uh, the energy efficient side and the climate benefits, uh, on the health side, there has been nothing really uh, um, coming forth. We still have very high levels of uh, pollutants in uh, people's homes. We have deaths being reported. Like Kenya last year reported about 21,000 deaths. And uh, this year, we don't know what will be uh, documented. But going to the hospitals also, you find that there's a very high uh, population of deaths also being linked to like acute respiratory uh, 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 in infections as high as 26% uh, 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 from last year. Next, uh, please. So this calls for a shift in well, what I'm calling the focus of shift in the narrative, whereby we have uh, tried to promote interventions informed by the energy and climate first narrative, and we need to switch that to the health first uh, focus, whereby we try and bring a health consideration to the fore. You know, we need to give it a human face. This is what I'm just trying to talk about here. 
And we've also learned from the other type of interventions what policy can really do. So we need to focus on both national policy, we also need to go regional, and also we need to uh, uh, focus on international policy that is relevant in pushing our national governments to be able to do the right things here. The other one is, of course, the need to focus more on kids uh, because of what we've really experienced. Like, for example, in Kenya, the statistics that we, we received, I mean, lots and lots of reports, be it pneumonia, be it asthma, be it, um, you know, all these respiratory-related uh, uh, ailments are being mainly, uh, in, you know, linked to the kids. And a lot of these, again, are being linked to uh, household air. Uh, pollution that is resulting from the cooking fuels that we are using. So, um, as, as a result of that, we at the East Africa Institute here at the APU uh, East Africa have uh, a work program in development where we are focusing uh, with three entry points. The first one is influencing local and regional policy, whereby we have the bioenergy strategy underway, under development by the Ministry of Energy in Kenya. And we have been given a privilege of doing a, a review of it. And this gives us a chance to integrate some of what we have learned uh, in, this, in this field. We just had interns who did quite a lot of work studying interventions across the world and trying to identify options which we can actually uh, integrate into this great document. We also have the African Union's uh, Africa Children's Charter, which actually emphasizes on the rights of children to different things, including uh, uh, proper health, including protection from exposure to harmful chemicals and, uh, you know, other um, harmful stuff. So this is one of those that we are going to partner with others to be able to influence uh, change on. The, then the, the second big thing we want to do is developing uh, our intervention. And here we would like to focus on experiences and lessons that we've learned from uh, places like India, from Brazil, and from other uh, developing countries that have gone ahead. And they have developed certain models that we can adopt, for example, in fast tracking adoption of uh, uh, fuels like uh, LPG, for example, among the poor, and so on. So this is one of the areas where we would like to take a lead on by integrating research in the interventions. And then we have, uh, Dan, I lost you. <laughs> yeah, so, um, <laughs> yeah, so the, 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 the final point I wanted to mention was that we uh, wanted to build evidence on how household air pollution is actually impacting on mental health. And one of the ways in which we are doing this, we are jointly with the Brain and Mind Institute at the Aga Khan uh, University, developing a joint initiative whereby we are going to map out, um, you know, the impact of household air pollution on mental health and particularly on cognitive performance of kids. Uh, who are aged under six. So this is just one of the things that we'll do. And hopefully, whatever comes out of that study, we shall be able to build on with other uh, colleagues in uh, in Institute for Human Health, in Population Department, the Medical College, and also uh, IGD. So uh, I would like to pass this on back to Sophie, maybe. Take us forward. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Evans, and uh, thank you for that very interesting presentation. So we now have uh, three illustrious panelists, and I'm going to pass the floor to them for quick comments. And then we'll open this, ladies and gentlemen, for questions and discussion. We've already received uh, quite a number of interesting questions in the Q&A and in the chat, and I'll try and do justice to those. Uh, keep them coming. We, have, we will have time for uh, about half an hour of discussion. So uh, let me pass us to our three panelists, and I'll just introduce them quickly. Uh, Paul Dalla is the Director of Environment, Climate and Sustainability at the Afghan Development Network. Uh, he is the Vice Chair of the AKDN's Environment and, and Climate Committee. And you have his uh, other major achievements and attributes in front of you. 
We are also very pleased uh, and we recognize that we have not been able to maintain appropriate gender balance amongst the panelists this time, which we hope will be rapidly redressed. So Tini Soni is the chief executive of the Alcon Foundation in India and has a special interest on issues of agriculture, livestock development for small uh, holders. And she's worked on particularly gender perspectives in development. And last but not the least, we have our, our very own Roy Siddle from the Direct Mountain Societies Research Institute and, and uh, the Earth and Environmental Sciences Program at the University of Central Asia. Uh, he's based in Khorok in Tajikistan. He's joining us from, uh, from uh, potentially there. And he has uh, had special interest in uh, natural hazards, uh, water resources, and natural resources. So let me start, let me start by asking Paul followed by Tini and then Roy to make a few comments, and then we'll have our general discussion. Thank Paul. You. Thanks, Thanks Sophie. Um, I'm actually speaking from Vancouver, uh, where we are currently immersed in some smoke from the fires, uh, which were alluded to earlier. Um, but of course, most of the geographies where AKDN works are much more severely impacted by environmental degradation and climate change. And, um, and of course, it's the poor within those geographies that are most severely affected. Um, thinking of places like Central Asia, South Asia, and East Africa, um, where uh, climate-related natural disasters, heat waves, water shortages, biodiversity loss, and agricultural challenges um, mean that AKDN's work on environment and climate really has to be framed in terms of our goals of improving quality of life and well-being of the poorest and most vulnerable. And I was struck listening to all the speakers how, how, how they really focused on um, the, the, the impact of environment and climate on the poorest and most vulnerable. Um, and I think that, 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 is, that is critical and particularly critical for an organization like, like AKDN, where we are situating our environment and climate work uh, within the context of our of our, of our development work. And, and it was with, with this in mind that um, last year we launched an AKDN-wide environment and climate initiative, which uh, was endorsed by His Highness the Aga Khan. It's led by, by Prince Raheem Aga Khan. And it's supported by an AKDN environment and climate committee, which uh, Zulfi mentioned. Uh, the ECC's approach um, situates climate within the wider context of environmental degradation. So it includes things like environmental toxins, plastics, pollutions, on the basis that the climate change, while it's the most important problem at a global level, it's not the only environmental problem in terms of people's lived experience. And I was also struck by how each of the speakers uh, really focused on, on, um, on some of the things that are sometimes forgotten, like, like, like household air pollution. Um, uh, you know, suicides of farmers as a, as a result of, 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 of um, environmental problems. Um, and I think that the, the second approach that, that our, our committee takes is it assumes that all, all of the AKDN agencies and institutions are involved in the Environment and Climate Initiative. Like AKDN does not have a, a single Environment and Climate Agency or institution that each of the agencies and institutions has a role to play consistent with its own mandate in helping to protect the environment and mitigate further climate change and helping communities adapt to an already changing climate. And um, this is because environmental degradation and climate change impacts all aspects of quality of life. It connects everything, uh, it connects to everything that AKDN, AKDN does. So, so health, and healthcare as we're discussing today, but also disaster mitigation, land use and livelihoods, agriculture and food security, planning and construction, energy use and consumption, education and curriculum, et cetera. And I think that, that, that this was also really interesting to me. Uh, uh, all the speakers uh, made these very interesting connections. Uh, for example, Professor Zati, the, the connection between you know, agriculture and food security and climate. Um, uh, professors Fatmi and, and, and Katui, the connection to mental health and, and climate and, and environmental degradation. So, so I just wanted really just to, to congratulate 
the, 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 all the speakers for such wonderful uh, uh, talks that, that, that really um, brought out some of the nuances, the, the nuances at a human level uh, uh, of, of, of um, environmental degradation and climate change. And also I wanted to also congratulate um, AKU's new uh, Institute for Global Health and Development for, for really being, a, a, I don't know, a living embodiment of, of all of what we've been trying to do. Uh, uh, and, and I think that, 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 that it, the fact that it's interdisciplinary and integrated into the wider AKDN uh, can, only be, can only be good. Um, anyway, those were my, my, my comments. I, I, I think there are many, many uh, uh, questions uh, in, the, in the question section. I, so I don't want to speak any longer. And, and also we have two, two, two excellent panelists to come. So I, 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 I hand things over to, to Tim. Uh, uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, and just echoing what um, uh, Paul has said, uh, it, uh, the, the three presentations also brought out aspects of linkages and the health dimensions of, say, climate change that, uh, uh, you know, sometimes we do tend to overlook. Uh, the issue of, um, uh, uh, you know, increasing farmer suicides as, say, um, uh, say drought conditions increased, rainfall was less. Uh, we have noticed that even in our work, um, and the impact on um, uh, uh, that on the lives of uh, uh, farmers as, um, uh, uh, you know, and then the other implications in terms of reduced access to food for their family members since the main uh, bread earner has gone. Uh, also, the whole issue of indoor air pollution. So could we do much more in terms of actually improving access to renewable energy to reduce the impact of smoke uh, uh, within the homes? Uh, I also feel that perhaps we could focus uh, uh, quite a lot on empowering women and uh, uh, say, uh, uh, can we look at where uh, uh, the focus has been on strengthening, say, women's collectives, information around women, and women are the key decision makers. Does, how does that actually then impact health outcomes also in terms of access to food, access to nutrition for themselves and for their uh, uh, families. So perhaps that could also be something that we could uh, uh, look at uh, quite a lot. The health impacts of sustainable farming, um, uh, you know, in communities where, say, more um, organic farming, sustainable farming practices have been introduced, how does that uh, impact uh, the health of those uh, households? Uh, those are also things that we are looking at over here. And uh, uh, the collaboration with this new institute would really help uh, in, in those areas. Um, uh, diet diversity is another uh, area that perhaps we, could, we would really value a collaboration uh, around uh, uh, that. Given the very unique situation that we are in, uh, in a pandemic uh, situation, the whole idea of One Health and the linkages between environmental degradation, um, uh, livestock, and then the health of uh, 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 human health as well. So if one could look at also those uh, linkages, which also the presenters have uh, brought out, that when uh, uh, communities are going through a climate insecure uh, situation, there is an adverse impact on their health. So we, these could be issues, um, a much broader look at health dimensions and linking them with livelihoods, women's empowerment, and also uh, 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 climate change and variations uh, in that. So I'll hand over to Roy, uh, uh, you know, for his comments. Thank you. Thank you so Roy. much. Thank you. Uh, Roy Seidel, I'm the director of the Mountain Society's Research Institute and professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences at UCA and on the Harag campus, but right now I'm in Pencil central Pennsylvania, uh, which is my home state. I appreciate having uh, been asked to have MSRI at this fora. I think we can bring some things to this issue of this new Institute of Global Health and Development. I think there are a lot of, lot of the work that we do related to climate change and anthropogenic change that we're engaged in uh, has very big relevance to human health. And 
I'm looking forward to really having some nice collaborations in the future with this group. As a biogeophysical scientist, I'm always curious about not just the statistics. We've heard a lot of statistics presented, and that's where you start. That's where you start seeing the evidence. But I'm very curious about the causal. And I think that is a grand challenge facing us. In fact, one of the things Paul actually uh, inferred was that we have some difficulties many times in separating certain anthropogenic changes from climate change. And I certainly agree with that. Um, a lot of times it's very convenient to blame anything that's happening on climate change. It might not just be climate change and there might be many interactions between anthropogenic change and climate change. Uh, in Paul's presentation, he gave a couple examples that, which we're working on. We do work on um, sustainable food security and improving, improving health of mountain communities. We're looking at things like more diverse diets for local people, but we also are looking at water issues, which is the underlying restriction in agricultural production in these dry land mountain communities of North Afghanistan and Tajikistan and parts of Kyrgyzstan. And a lot of the climate change generalizations don't really help very much in terms of, of the year to year and season to season agricultural production. We need to do better than that. We need to be able to be able to predict what the water supplies are going to be for individual years. And they vary spatially within fairly small areas in mountainous topography. So that's a critical, that's an example of a critical issue. Another thing would be natural hazards. That those natural hazards, some of those natural hazards are increasing. They certainly impact human health, but we don't have good data on that. So we need to be able to collect good data, things like snow avalanches, landslides, debris fans, where agriculture is practiced in these areas. They have, they have debris flows that occur periodically that'll wipe out those areas where people are living or practicing their agriculture. This is very common in, in that region. Uh, so securing sustainable supplies of safe drinking water is another big issue, and is something that we are interested in. Uh, these local communities often just get their wa drinking water supplies out of the, of the, the neighboring streams, and issues there with land management and with climate change have implications for that. But we need to be able to sort out those issues. So again, coming back to this idea of of causal linkages. So uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities for Mountain Society's Research Institute to interact with people in this new AKU Institute for Global Health and Development. Uh, I think we can provide some of the foundational geoscience, environmental science attributes that will help solve some of these causal linkages. So with that, I think I'll, I'll uh, defer so we can get into some of the discussions. I'll defer to some of the questions that, that people have um, arisen. Thank you very much, Roy. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to start and see if we can answer some of the questions. And I'm going to try and mix this a little bit. So, Majid, the, a question on the seasonality effect of injuries and, uh, and climate change uh, also pertains to the potential uh, relationship with educational activities. I mean, is that an added element of stress uh, that you also have evaluations and others around that time? Also, is there any evidence that these may be um, even dispersed around a 24-hour cycle differently in those peak periods that might lead credibility to physiological reasons for uh, risky behaviors or uh, poor driving. Over, sure. Over yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think I think one of the lessons of, of epidemiology of injuries for for decades is that is that 
um, unlike things like uh, bugs and 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 uh, heart and lung and so on that are pretty physiological mechanisms, uh, injuries are extremely context dependent, and and context is a broad issue. So 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 uh, it's the it's uh, so, uh, so, so, so there will be aspects that are seasonal, and 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 there is, there is a literature on how things like uh, light and temperature and perhaps humidity influence uh, human function and, and human mood. But uh, I mean, I, I, so 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 uh, we didn't get into the question of 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 hours of the day. I suspect it matters, and and I suspect that. Injuries uh, at night and during the day with temperature may 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 well uh, act out differently. Certainly, when we get to things like drowning or to things like uh, homicide and suicide, hour of the day must matter. That that people have more so interaction. So so uh, I mean I think the short answer is that uh, it almost certainly does. And and yet um, I think perhaps to take lessons from what I said is that so so the one generalization we can make is that is that the pathways that influence injuries some of uh, a few of them physiological a whole bunch of them at the level of individuals and and others yet at the level of communities um, are temperature dependent and uh, and how how individuals behave or how communities interact will be affected by temperature by and hence by climate change but but i think i i, I do want to i do want to again uh, come back to the very last note that i made which is that uh, you know climate change will will increase anomalies uh, that's that's so, so so in fact more so than than being a warmer world uh, it it's it's going to become a more unpredictable world uh, but you know a lot of those situations exist right now and and it's not at all uh, too too early to be putting uh, putting uh, mechanisms for actually dealing with these issues that will have benefits right now and then continue into the future. Thank you, thank you, Majid. So I have a question jointly for um, um, Zafar and Evans, uh, and this is um, uh, you know related to how reliable our historical data on climate change, given that there may be measurement errors and, and reporting errors. And linked to that is also the question from the same person that uh, in terms of contribution to global climate change, aren't volcanoes a much greater culprit than um, anything that humans or other human related activity can do? So maybe you could both take that question, Tafar and Evans. In other words, how real is the climate change? May, may I go, go ahead first? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, uh, this climate change, um, you know, has been a, a debate for the last 20 years or so. So whether the climate change is actually happening or not happening, and whether this is a fake data, and it's still, you, know, you see the global politics on that. Um, and... What I was recently, you know, reading about this uh, that said that 99% of the scientists agree that it is the real data and uh, they have agreed, but there are still few scientists uh, and they have a name on the Google. If you Google them, you can find them. And there are papers which have been put forth uh, from them that this is, uh, you know, you, we had... Uh, more uh, pollution in the medieval period, for example, than the industrial period. So, uh, so there has been questions uh, raised about this uh, climate change, uh, but but those have, over time, uh, those scientists have reduced in number, and there are more and more uh, scientists. More than ninety-nine percent have agreed that this is the real data. And we are seeing uh, certainly a climate change. So this is not fake, and this yeah. is this is really happening. Yeah. So I, I think the question was posed more for information rather than doubting uh, any of the figures. This was from Shringashu Chanda from, I believe, Bangladesh. Um, uh, Evans, any comments on the comment on the relative contribution of various, um, uh, you know, factors to climate change, such as volcanoes? Um, 
I don't think I'm the best person to comment on that at the moment, but going by um, what, uh, for example, the IPCC has used and, uh, you know, other uh, leading uh, institutions around uh, um, that, I would want to say that the, the, the um, maybe in the, re in the regions, you know, these are likely to vary depending on what kind of uh, sources, potential sources are there. For example, if you have some of the mountainous sources, some of the uh, uh, natural marshlands or whatever, you know, they're quite converted, where there are so many, or rather where they are abundant. Um, those are likely to influence how much of the different types of greenhouse gas emissions may, may emerge. But otherwise, at the moment, I don't think uh, we have uh, that clarity on the, we, what source gives how much, but there's reasonable estimates that we can rely on. Thank you. Well, I'll pass on to uh, Tini and Paul. There is a question on gender dimensions and climate change, and particularly in the context of South Asia and Africa. Is it fair to say that the impact of climate change is disproportionate in terms of gender, relate, gender impacts? Does it affect women much worse than it does men in particular circumstances? And if so, how do we bring a gender lens to climate change mitigation strategies? Um, I, 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 I'll, I think I'll defer mostly to Tinny on this one because I think she, she, she has a better grounding. But I would say that, um, that the, the presentations by both professors uh, Fatmi and, and Katui both, uh, both um, flagged the issue of, um, of disproportionate impact on women and children. Um, in this case, in the context of household air pollution, uh, for understandable reasons, uh, perhaps. But, um, but I think on the wider on the wider issue of uh, of gender disproportionality, I, I, I defer to Tim. Um, so I think one of the impacts of climate change is on uh, reducing food supplies. And uh, in a situation where uh, food supplies are reducing, there is definitely an adverse impact on women and uh, on young children. Uh, so for example, in South Asia, what we're actually also seeing is that um, uh, there are high levels of anemia among uh, women. And that uh, then translates into low birth weight children and intergenerational uh, stunting. And that is linked to the lack of uh, uh, food and, and more importantly, the lack of nutrition. So uh, there is definitely an impact, an adverse impact on climate change uh, uh, on uh, women and uh, uh, children, most definitely. Also, the fact that um, uh, uh, work around collecting drinking water, storing drinking water for the home, collecting fuel wood, firewood, uh, is work that women uh, uh, generally do in our communities. And as climate change uh, uh, impacts the supply of water, women have to walk further distances to collect uh, 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 water. Likewise for fuel wood, likewise for fodder for livestock. These are all uh, the roles of uh, uh, women. We've also seen that climate change also uh, uh, affects what we call natural greens growing uh, in fields that were often a very important source of iron in diets. We've seen those natural greens now diminishing and they are not a part of uh, uh, diets anymore. So I would say most definitely there is a, a, a greater impact on uh, uh, women uh, as a result of climate change. Great, wonderful. Uh, Roy, uh, as uh, the head of a major program at UCA, how, how do you think one can bring broader collaboration between uh, institutes such as yours and the new investments that have been made within AKU, not just the medical college, but also the Brain and Mind Institute, the Institute for Global Health and Development. What, uh, what are the modalities for ensuring that we all sing from the same hymn sheet? I think this kind of goes back to what I was talking about before, that we need to dig deeper into these problems um, to look at the causal linkages. I think that, uh, and this is what we can add to the equation, if you will, um, 
there's many issues like the availability of water, for example, is so critical in, in our region and in Northern Afghanistan and in a lot of other parts in Africa as well. And we need to understand, for example, is this climate variability or is it climate change or is it climate variability induced by climate change? And, and I think that latter part is something that's really a tough nut to crack, but we need to understand that. We need to be able to, on a year to year basis for these local farmers, we need to understand that and we need to be able to come up with some solutions for them to conduct their business. Uh, it might not be business as usual, but again, this idea of, of green crops, Satina just pointed out, can we come up with smart, uh, smart irrigation methods, uh, climate smart irrigation methods? They're, they exist, but they haven't been applied in a lot of these areas. Actually, probably 80 to 90 percent of the water for agriculture is being lost by inefficient trans, uh, transfer systems, irrigation canals, and poor, ag poor irrigation practices. So there's a lot we can do to, uh, to mitigate this. And I think we have the expertise that we can bring to the table to help address some of those problems. Um, could, I, could I just comment on this? You asked about the volcano thing, and I think I can tell a really quick analogy on that. It's basically this, the idea of magnitude and frequency that we always talk about in geomorphology. And volcanoes are infrequent, the big volcanic eruptions, infrequent but high impact uh, events, which have a huge effect on global climate, but very episodically, whereas climate change is an ongoing, more, more chronic kind of a situation. It can induce some episodic events, but it's nothing like the, the, the big volcanic eruptions, but they only occur very infrequently. Okay. So uh, we have uh, just a few minutes left, and I would like to try and see if we can summarize what has been a fascinating uh, webinar and inaugural webinar on a topic. So just to say, th this is precisely why the Institute for Global Health and Development has been set up to principally tackle uh, what some of you would recognize as wicked problems. Uh, these are big issues. These are issues that concern all disciplines, whether they are uh, people in faculties of arts and sciences, education, in health, in development, or in special studies such as the Institute of Studies of Muslim Civilizations or, or Mountain Research Institutes, AKD and SPEL and AKU spans all of those geographies. There is also a very clear nexus between climate change and conflict that we have not addressed in this webinar today. Few people recognize that you know, many of the real problematic recent wars, whether they were in Darfur or the initiation of the Syria conflict, had their roots and genesis and in lack of resources and fights, fights over resources such as water. It is the objective of the IGSD to uh, initiate dialogue and scholarship around those disciplines uh, using all the assets and resources of the university. And I would urge all of the participants of uh, this particular webinar, which have at peak uh, numbered over 150 from all parts of the world to stay engaged, in particular to faculty and staff and students at the Aga Khan University and AKDN partners. There will be an opportunity for both scholarship uh, relating to knowledge synthesis in this space, uh, assessment of best possible mitigation strategies, and even experimental stuff that will be prospective. And that word does require that you keep in touch. I'd like to make a plug for the Institute for Global Health and Development's website that has just been launched. It's uh, very simple to access. It's worldwideweb.aku.edu backslash IGSD. And it's a website that we will populate with materials and information related to issues like global health and development illustrated by the topic that we've chosen for today. So it remains for me to thank all the participants of this webinar. We will have the recording available and the chat and questions, particularly those few that does, do require some answers and we could not address in plenary, 
we will be providing an opportunity for answers to people individually and make the chat available. I'd urge you all to stay connected and, and, put, and with the working group on climate change, health and development within uh, AKU uh, that will be spearheaded by Dr. Zafar Fatmi and Evan Skitui from our South Central Asia and uh, East Africa campuses. Uh, I'd like you to remain in touch and see how we can potentially participate in future projects, including small-scale research studies. I'd like to thank the people who made this webinar possible, uh, the very strong management team led by Dinah Mackay, um, uh, Shamsa, and also Mariam Farooq, who, uh, who have played a major role in making this happen. Uh, I, I wonder if there are any specific questions that you would like to raise. My own email is sulpekar.butta at aku.edu, and you could also mail, it, mail us at ITHP. To make a plug for future webinars, we will be holding one on, on women in science uh, related to our focus on gender and health. And in early in the new year, we will be holding a joint webinar with the Coalition of Centers and Global Child Health on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Food Security. I'd like to particularly thank all of you who have joined for various geographies and times. Our lead speakers, Majid Zati from Imperial, Zafar Fatmi from Aga Khan University, Karachi, and Evans Katui from the East Africa Institute, Paul Dalla, Tini Soni, and Roy Siddle. So thank you, God bless, and keep in touch.